encourage you to be taking out your Bibles this evening and following along to test the things I have to say, to see that they be by God's Word. I hope we'll find them to be the truth and we'll take and apply them on our everyday walks of life and we can leave here being better servants of God in the future than we have been in the past. In the passage that was just read for us in Proverbs chapter 3 and in verse 5, it's probably a, a, a verse that is very well familiar to each and every one of us. In which Solomon, in writing by inspiration, said, To trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. And I want us to consider those first four words this evening. Trust in the Lord. And what is recorded here for us in this text in Proverbs chapter 3 and in verse 5. And I want us to consider that in this passage, in these verses, in verses 5 through 8 that were just read for us, he tells us what it means to trust in the Lord. And he tells us the benefits of trusting in the Lord. And so let's begin by talking about what it means to trust in the Lord. We all will agree that it is important that we put our faith and our trust in God. But what does that mean? That's great, we all agree we need to put faith and trust in God, but that doesn't exactly do me any good unless I know what that trust looks like. Well, let's understand that the trust that is talked about in the Scriptures is a trust that is with a whole heart, or with all your heart. Look at verse 5 again of Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. You see, he tells us we need to trust the Lord with all our heart. This is wholehearted devotion in service to God. Now, if somebody truthfully trusts in the Lord, it means that they are fully. Their faith is fully in God. They're putting all their trust, all their confidence in Him. You can say you trust in the Lord, but unless you're willing to fully put your trust in Him with a whole heart, you trust Him wholeheartedly, then you don't really have the kind of trust that the Scriptures is talking about. But if one truthfully has this wholehearted trust, it, it displays itself in a wholehearted devotion in service to God. You know, in the book of Deuteronomy, it is Moses' speeches on the plains of Moab there before the people are going to enter in to the promised land. And Moses is not going to enter in with them, and, and most of that generation is passing away that had spied out the land uh, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. But as he's giving these speeches, he's giving some reminders to them in the book of Deuteronomy about here's what you need to be like in your service to God. You know, this phrase, with a whole heart or with all your heart, is a common phrase used by Moses in those speeches. For example, he tells them to seek the Lord with all your heart. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. We want to know what wholehearted trust looks like. Again, it's wholehearted devotion to God. Here's what that wholehearted devotion looks like. He tells them in Deuteronomy 4.29, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find Him if you seek Him with all your heart and with all your soul. This is not them just saying, I'm going to seek out the Lord and then not really seeking Him out. Oh, I'm going to seek out the Lord... But it's kind of like, well, where's, where, where's the Lord at? And, and, and then they give up. They are seeking Him with a whole heart. These are the kind of people that are searching out to find what God would have them to be and to live the kind of life pleasing in the eyes of God. And they're doing that with wholehearted devotion. And that wholehearted seeking for the Lord leads to a wholehearted love for the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and in verse 5, a passage well familiar to us in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and in verse 5, Moses told them there, in another part of the speeches in the plains of Moab, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. 
We're familiar with that passage, less for Deuteronomy's account and more for Jesus' quotation of it in the Gospel of Matthew uh, and, and Mark, where he quotes from that passage referring back when he's asked about what's the greatest command, and he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. And the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. But Moses told them that here in Deuteronomy. He's telling them, by the way, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you're open to Deuteronomy chapter 6, think about the context. He told them in verse 5 to love the Lord their God with all their heart. But he told them in verse 5 to therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's been telling them here, be careful. Observe what God commanded you. Go into this land. Take this land. Remember the Lord your God. The Lord is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. He tells them down in verse 6 that they should take the things that were commanded and they should be in their heart. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But this wholehearted devotion and love for the Lord is because as they have sought Him out, as they are told to do in chapter 4, and they, they, they realize how great the Lord is, they're going to love Him with their whole heart. That leads to service with a whole heart. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. We're still in Deuteronomy. Remember, we're, we're, we're trying to find out what does it mean to trust in the Lord with a whole heart. It means wholehearted service and devotion. It means wholehearted service and devotion in every aspect of our life. It's wholehearted a seeking of the Lord. It's a wholehearted love for the Lord. And here is a whole, or all, using all our heart to serve the Lord. Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways and to love Him... To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You know, it's possible for one to be serving the Lord, or at least claiming to be serving the Lord, and not give it with a whole heart. You think about some of those things you go through in, in, in scriptures, that they're willing to follow God's commands, just so long as it doesn't conflict with anything they want. They're willing to follow God's commands until it gets difficult. You think about the, the, the parable of the sower. We'll see that uh, here in, in chapter 8, I believe it is, when we get into Luke chapter 8 here in just a couple of weeks. And as you're looking at that parable of the sower, there's the different grounds. One of those accepted the word, and then when the trials of life came, it was the, it was the thorny ground, it choked the word out. You see, a wholehearted devotion and a wholehearted service to God means they sought Him out with their whole heart. And as they're wholeheartedly serving Him and fearing Him, they're going to walk in His ways. Wholehearted service means I'm going to follow the commands of God no matter the consequences. Wholehearted service is required for a wholehearted trust. And finally, wholehearted obedience is required. Really, this all just leads up to this point here. If you sought out the Lord with a whole heart, and now you love Him with a whole heart, and you're willing to serve Him with a whole heart, you're going to obey with all your heart. Look at Deuteronomy 26, 16. This day, Deuteronomy 26, 16. This day, the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. Therefore, you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. This is wholehearted obedience. He, he tells them to observe them with all their heart. And think about this illustration for just a second. A parent tells a child, you need to go clean your room. Now, children don't like having to go clean their room. And the child may obey... But they might throw a fit on their way down there. The child might obey, but you can hear them murmuring under their breath as they go. The child might obey, but you can tell they're only obeying because they're afraid of the consequences. Which we ought to be afraid, by the way, of the consequences of not serving God. And we'll talk about fear here later on in this text. But the fact is, you would say that child obeyed, but it's not, it's not on a wholehearted uh, obedience out of reverence and respect for their parents. It's a lot more like uh, half-hearted service out of fear of getting a spanking if they don't obey. 
Well, the wholehearted service of God is going to involve that reverence and respect for God. And again, we'll talk about that when we get to fear here in a moment. But it involves reverence and respect to the point that we're willing to do the commands of God and we're willing to do them with all our heart. We are glad to be able to obey the commands of God. We're, we're going to do it with a whole heart. We're going to listen to what He said because of who He is and we're going to follow it out. Not stomping our feet or stomp, stomping as we go and dragging our feet behind us and murmuring about, I don't like what I have to do and I wish I didn't have to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway because God said I had to do it. It requires a wholehearted service and a willingness to be obedient to the commands that the Lord has given to us. And when you do that, when you do all that, what you end up with is somebody who's got a wholehearted trust in God. Trust begins with the whole heart. Unless your whole heart is in it, you can't fully trust in God. But now part of this wholehearted trust that is talked about in this text involves us not leaning on our own understanding. Proverbs 3, verse 5, and again in verse 7. Trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. You know, it is easy for one to do what they think is best. It's easy for one to follow what they believe they ought to do regardless of the commands of God. It's easy for one to say, well, I think we ought to do this over here, or I think we ought to do that over here. Let's go back to our illustration a second ago with the parent-child relationship. We said a child may obey, but they may obey reluctantly. Let's go back to that and think about this leaning on their own understanding. Think back to when you were a child or raising your children. There was a point at your, there was probably a point when either you were raising your children or your parents were raising you, maybe both, where the child thought they were wiser than the parents. That's the way it happens a lot of times in our society today. Children will be left to themselves. They think they're so much wiser than their parents. Well, the parents don't know what they've been through. Right? That's the, the, the general thought with kids. They're, that they're so wise and the parents just don't know what it's like to be a teenager. And the parents are trying to instruct them, here's what you need to do. If the child would quit being lifted up with their own pride and listen to their parents, it could save a lot of heartache. Because the parents oftentimes learn from experience themselves firsthand, and they're trying to pass that wisdom on to their children. Well, we need to listen to our Heavenly Father and what He tells us we need to do. You see, there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Proverbs 14, 12 as well as chapter 16 and in verse 25. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And sometimes like that child thinks that they're wiser than their parents. Sometimes we think, if it, it, and we may not want to admit this, but it, it's the truth. When we reject God's commands for what we think, what we're in reality saying is, I think I'm wiser than God. I think my way's better than God's way. I think my plan's better than God's plan. We may not admit that, but the fact is, that's exactly what it is when we follow what we want over what God says. It's the height of all arrogance, by the way, to consider oneself wiser than the Almighty Creator. Well, you see, we need to not follow what we think is best. Again, the end thereof is the ways of death. We do not need to follow what we think is best. Because it's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Instead, we follow the commands of God because ultimately God is taking care of us. God is doing what is best for us. It's not on the board, but go to, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I recommend anybody that highlights or underlines in your Bible, highlight or underline verse 24 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6 and in verse 24. Sometimes we wonder, why does God tell us what we... Why does God command it this way or that way? Deuteronomy 6, 24. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. 
that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. God's far wiser than any of us will ever be. God is the almighty creator. And God gave these instructions back in the book of Deuteronomy. And the same thing with the commandments he gives us under the new law today. For our good always. We need to follow his commands. And not what we think is best. Remember in the book of Isaiah. Again, not on the board, but remember in the book of Isaiah. Where it's pointed out in the book of Isaiah. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 and in verse 8, that for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, if we're real fully going to trust in God, we trust in His Word and not what we think is best. We follow His commands because His ways are higher than our ways and His commands are for our good always. So somebody says, what does it mean to trust in the Lord? Well, it means a wholehearted service and devotion. It means not leaning on your own understanding and instead turning to what He says and His words and His wisdom. And it means in all your ways acknowledge Him. Look at verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths, or steps. Now the Hebrew word rendered acknowledge in this text is often rendered to know. The idea is to know God. And, and, and understand this for a second. This does not mean you know about God. I think we need to draw a distinction sometimes. There's a difference in knowing about God and knowing God. Knowing God involves far more than saying, hey, I believe that God exists and that He's the creator of the world. Knowing God involves far more than that. Knowing God is the relationship a Christian has with God. And so we want to know God because that shows true faith and trust in Him. But how do we know God? Go to 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and in verse 9. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 is David giving some instructions to his son Solomon as his life is coming to an end. Here's what he told him in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and in verse 9. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father. Know the God of your father. He didn't tell him to know about God. He told him to know God. Here's what he told him that meant. Know God and serve Him with a loyal or a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understandings, all the intents of the thoughts. If you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you forsake Him, He will cast you off forever. There are two components here. He said, if you want to be a to know God, you need to first and foremost serve Him. Some translations say with a whole heart, others say with a loyal heart. Both are true. We already saw the need for wholehearted service to God. But there's this loyal service to God. Remember when you go back to the Ten Commandments, that they were to have no other gods before Him? We come to the New Testament today and God is going to be first in our lives. Remember Matthew chapter 6, where it's pointed out about, therefore do not worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear. Don't worry about the things of this life, but seek ye first, Matthew 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You see, what we need to realize is we need to have our prior priorities in order. We need to have a loyal heart in our service to God. Our allegiance cannot be split. For no one can serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24, for he will love one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
You can't be over here and say, on Sundays, I'm going to come to worship services and I'm going to serve God. And on Monday, I'm going to serve my job. And on Tuesday, I'm going to serve money. And on Wednesday, I'm going to go back to service and serve God, at least in the evening. We'll see what I do in the morning. And on Thursday, I'm going to serve myself. And on Friday, I'm going to serve the television. And on Saturday, I'm going to serve, I'm, I'm going to serve sports. And now, if Sunday rolls back around, I'm back to serving God again. That's not very loyal part. Loyal heart requires God being first and foremost in our lives. So a loyal heart means we put God above all else. Although those other things, there may not be anything wrong with them. But are they taking the priority over God? Are we making them gods in and of themselves? Are we serving ourselves and making ourselves a God? Remember in Philippians as well as Romans. Philippians 3 and Romans 15 or 16. It's pointed out about those whose, whose gods were their belly. That is, they served their, as the New American Standard said, their own appetite. What they wanted. Is that the kind of service we give to God? Or are we serving Him with a whole heart? Like David told Solomon. With a loyal heart. God is most important in our lives. And if we find our priorities getting out of order, we'll make sure we set them straight because God needs to be first. But it doesn't just require a whole or loyal heart. It requires a willing mind. Again, this is somebody that wants to serve God. Service to God is not done out of necessity. Yes, if we want to be saved, it is necessary we serve God. But the service to God is done with a willing mind. Remember... If you're using a willing mind, you're serving Him w w willingly, it means you want to be there to serve God. It's not something you feel uh, begrudging to do. It's not something you feel you have to do, but you want to do. You want to do it because you remember who God is. He is the Creator of the world. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. You want to serve God because of what He did. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You serve God because of what He did, and you serve God because of what He's going to do if you serve Him faithfully. It will be on that day that you will hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into thy rest. When you realize who God is and what He's done for you, you can't help. But serve Him willingly. It's not something you feel like you have to do. You have to drag yourself to service to God, but you want to serve God. As the psalmist's attitude was when it came to worship, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. What does it mean to trust in the Lord? It means wholehearted devotion. It means you don't seek your you, you don't put your own understanding or lean on your own understanding and seek out what you think. You seek out what God thinks. And you acknowledge him in all your ways, and it means you fear him. Look at verse 7. Proverbs chapter 3 and in verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Fearing God can mean two different things. The word fear is used multiple times throughout the scriptures to refer to two different components of fear. One of them is what we often think of that's actually being afraid. I think Hebrews 26 illustrates that point well. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 talks about willful sin and says, For if we sin willfully... After we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, verse 30, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's being afraid. Talked about it briefly in the invitation on Wednesday night, but in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, rather, chapter 5, verse 10, Paul talks about that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the things done in the body, whether they be good or evil. Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing the fact that there is punishment for sin, you serve God. Come back to our illustration of the parent-child relationship. That's the kid that's afraid of getting the spanking or getting grounded when they don't obey what their parents tell them to do. Their obedience is out of fear. But then there's a second component of fear that is reverence or respect. In Leviticus chapter 19 and in verse 14, Leviticus chapter 19, three passages in Leviticus 19 will make application of this. Leviticus 19, 14. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God, I am the Lord. Verse 30, you shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. Verse 32, you shall rise before the gray head and honor the presence of your old man and fear your God, I am the Lord. Same word. Reverence or fear here in Leviticus chapter 19. Now this is doing things out of reverence and respect for God. Let's go back to our parent-child illustration for just a second. When a child is at home, they obey because they don't want to get in trouble. As a child gets older, even before they leave home, hopefully they get to the point where they obey out of reverence and respect. They respect their parents. The time may come later on where one leaves their parents' house they're no longer under the responsibility to obey, but if their parents suggest something or ask them to do something, they'll do it out of respect for their parents. When you're 25 years old, you go back to visit your parents, you don't have to worry about a spanking if you don't obey. But I'll tell you what, they ask you to do something. You're probably going to do it out of reverence or respect. Well, oftentimes when we uh, obey God and we talk about fear, we think about the first component. Which is absolutely a part of it. I dare say most, if not all of us, probably obeyed the gospel in the first place because of the first fear of being afraid, actually afraid, terrified of the condemnation of hell for all of eternity. We were afraid of being lost and so we were motivated to obey. But the longer you serve God, you're motivated less by terror and more by reverence and respect. At least hopefully. Yes, you're still afraid of, being, of displeasing God and being condemned to hell for all of eternity. But you obey more because you reverence and respect God. The more you study, the more you're familiar with His Word, you reverence and respect Him and you obey because of who He is. Just like we talked about that loyal and heart and willing mind. You serve God because of who He is and what He's done for you. That fear, that terror becomes more reverence and respect. Both are needed. Both fears, though, are needed by those who, who trust in the Lord. If you truthfully trust in God, you're afraid of displeasing Him. You don't want to displease Him for the punishment of hell. And you don't want to displease Him just to not be pleasing in His sight. You know, it's possible for one who has sinned to repent of that sin and still have a reward in heaven, but I tell you, you have to live with the fact that you displeased your heavenly Father prior. And that reverence or respect will cause you to think about the fact that you displeased Him. And that may be part of your motivation for making things right, is that reverence or respect. Both fears are needed by those who trust in the Lord. Yes, you're afraid of displeasing Him, but you reverence, you respect Him. And that's why you obey. That's, the, by the way, the fear talked about in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, let it, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, verse 28 and 29 of Hebrews 12, let us offer to God acceptable worship with a reverence and godly fear, or reverence and all, is what it says there in verse 28. So part of trusting in God requires having the fear, the reverence and respect, and the being afraid of displeasing Him. And then the final thing it means is to turn away from evil. Verse 7. 
Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. You see, those who trust in the Lord will turn from evil and do good. 1 Peter 3.11, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him pursue, uh, seek peace and pursue it. One that trusts in God is going to turn away from doing evil and wicked things and turn to doing good because their trust in God causes them to obey His Word which tells them what they should and should not do. And so they're going to, be turn, they're going to turn from evil and do good. You see, the righteous individual is fleeing from sin. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lust. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. And I guess to illustrate how bad the city of Corinth is, is it'd be about like being in Las Vegas. It would have been like the first century of Las Vegas. The city was just so wicked. And if, it, if there was a sin to be committed, it was going on in Corinth. I mean, this is a city that had a thousand prostitutes serving daily at the temples there. And then Paul talks about what they should not do, or the unrighteous that don't inherit the kingdom of heaven. He said that if they shouldn't be deceived, that neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and such were some of you. What changed? What changed in these people? It was trust and fear of God. And you walk into the church, if you were to walk into the church at the doors of Corinth, you see this brother over here on the front pew, and you know what? He used to be a thief. But now he trusts in God, he's turned away from evil, and he's doing good. And then you walk over here, and you see this other brother on the other side of the pew, and you know what? He was guilty of adultery, but you know what changed? He trusted in God, he repented of that, and now he serves him. And, and you walk in a little bit further, and, and, and there's this sister over there, and she used to be a homosexual, but I tell you what, she's changed. She learned from the Lord, and what the truth is, she now trusts in Him, she fears Him, and she's turned away from that life of sin. And then maybe you see another brother who was, who was a drunkard, but he's changed. And he's turned away from that. What changed for all these people? To make them change such a way at the church of Corinth, they learned the truth and they learned to trust in God. And when one trusts in God, they turn from evil and they do good. And so that's what changed in these people. They learned the truth. They, they learned that they needed to seek the Lord with a whole heart to devote themselves entirely to Him. That they didn't need to lean on their own understanding, nor the understanding of those around them, but on the Word of God. They learned that they needed to come to know the Lord. They learned that they needed to fear God, both fear of being afraid and of reverence and respect, and that caused them to turn away from evil and to start being servants of the Almighty God. That's what changed. Because they trusted in the Lord. But what is the benefits of trusting in God? We, 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 we've now seen... We've now seen these five things that it means to trust in God, but what is the benefits of trusting in God? Well, number one, He'll direct your steps, Proverbs 3 and in verse 6. Proverbs chapter 3 and in verse 6, In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your steps. Proverbs 11, 5 points out that the righteousness of the blameless will direct His way aright. You see, when one is righteous, that is, they're doing right, their steps are being going in the right direction. But the reason for that is they trust in the Word of God and therefore they will obey. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 31. 2 Samuel 22, 31. As for God, His way is perfect. The Word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. You know why God's a shield to those who trust in Him? Because of His proven Word. His proven Word that they obey when they trust in Him. That's why the, righteous of the, blame, the righteousness of the blameless will direct His steps aright. Because now that they go into God's Word and they have that wholehearted trust in Him, they trust the Lord to direct their steps. And the steps are directed 
Not as in God actually taking them and leading them down that path, but because they're being directed by the Word of God and they're following the Word of God because of that trust and that leads them in the right direction, the direction that leads to heaven, not the direction that leads to condemnation. And so somebody has a trust in God, He'll direct their steps. Somebody has a trust in God, it's healing to their body or to their flesh. It'll be health to your flesh, verse 8. You see, those who trust in God are taken care of. Psalm 23 may be one of the most famous, if not the most famous, psalm in all of Scripture. And in Psalm 23, it said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not warn. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Listen closely. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And there's a, a, a book, and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's a book that's a, a study of Psalm 23 from a shepherd who talks about the illustrations used of Psalm 23 and how each of these things that are brought up in Psalm 23, how a shepherd would do that and how that relates to our relationship to God. Well, the anointing with oil, a shepherd would anoint his sheep's head with oil when there was a cut or, or something wrong with them that they needed to be healed. And we can be healed by God when we trust in His Word. We can be healed by, by the wounds of Christ. That will heal us if we serve Him and it's done because of the wounds of Christ. 1 Peter 2.24 who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. It's because of the sacrifice of Christ that we can be healed by his wounds. If we have trust in God, we can be healed from our wounds that we have spiritually. Because we have faith and trust in God, and he will take care of you as long as you serve him. As long as you're the shepherd of Psalm 23, who f listens and follows after Him carefully. And finally, it's refreshment to your bones. Verse 8. It will be health to your flesh and strength or refreshment to your bones. The word rendered refreshment in the New American Standard is the, is the idea of something to drink that refreshes your bones. Something to drink. I think Jesus discusses this point with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And I think this passage well illustrates this point. Those that trust in God have a drink that refreshes them. That drink is upon the Word of God itself. Go to John chapter 4. John 4 verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked of Him and He would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will never thirst again. But whoever drinks of the, or will, thirst, will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give them will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. I tell you, that's a pretty refreshing drink. Not one that quenches your physical thirst, but he says it's one that becomes a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That's the kind of drink we all need to partake of. This living water that Jesus talks about here in this text. And if we trust in God, then we partake of that living water that springs up into a fountain, into springing up into everlasting life. But that begins and ends ultimately with this point. Trust in the Lord. 
What does trust in the Lord involve? Well, trust in the Lord, as we saw this evening, involves service with the whole heart. It involves uh, leaning not on your own understanding, but acknowledging the Lord in all your ways and following His teachings. Fearing God and turning away from evil. And the benefit to that is He'll direct your steps by His Word. He'll heal your body by His Son. And your bones will be refreshed by that Word. And it will spring up into everlasting life. The question that really we have for you this evening is, do you put your trust in the Lord? Are you trusting in the Lord and in His Word? Because in His Word, He has promised you a home in heaven if you're a faithful servant of His. But the only way to have that home in heaven is by living a life pleasing to Him. And so if you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel, but you've heard the word of God and you believe in Jesus, that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, would you not repent of your sins? Confess your faith. Be buried in the waters of baptism, rising to walk into a newness of life. You do that because if you trust in the Lord and you want to show your trust in the Lord, you obey His commands. Maybe you're here and you've done that and you say, I, 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 I've, I obeyed the gospel, but somewhere along the line I didn't show the trust I should have. Maybe you decided to lean on your own understanding. If you sin in a private nature, then take it to the Lord privately in prayer. But if it is of a public nature or you desire the prayers of the brethren here, then we will pray with you and for you for God to forgive you. But no matter what your need is, if we could assist you in any way, would you not come forward as we stand and as we sing?